I'm grateful to everyone who's joined us tonight and all of our readers. And tonight is, tonight I'm really honored to hold space with these nine poets, Vivian Chu, Saray Janelle Johnson, Sonia Fama, Maylene Ma Seymour Major, <coughs> Merrick Goma, Anne Lai, Pamela Sneed, Michelle Fong Ting, and Daniel T. Gator Lomac. And the vibe tonight is going to be super chill or super intense, depending on what each poet brings to the table. And really, the, the this isn't meant to be a curatorial collection of poets. Instead, this is meant to be a group of friends really doing cute things over a cute hour. Uh, and with that, and really the, the, the sort of ins inspiration behind this is really thinking about poetry as being a, uh, this space of political action and not just creative thought um, and having this circle of friends who whose words I really admire and appreciate and so with no further ado um, I'm going to do some bios and then we'll jump right in with uh, <clears throat> actually I'm going to do I think it makes more sense to read each person's bio right before you read and so with no further ado we're going to open up with Vivian Chu Vivian Chu is a visual artist born in Los Angeles and raised in Hong Kong. She, is, she was recently awarded the NYFA Fellowship in Craft and Sculpture and is currently teaching at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I'd also like to add that Vivian is a dear friend of mine that I met during my time at, in, at Columbia University. It's an awesome woodworker and awesome friend and I'm so excited to hear what you have to share with us tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, White Columns and Jeffrey for having me. Um, I'm just gonna jump right in. This is for my Gong Gong. Every year we head to the concrete arena that is the Chung Kwan O Cemetery and climb a steep mountain of stairs to get to my grandfather's grave, amidst endless rows of neatly arranged gray tombstones on the hillside. It doesn't matter how old you were or what shape you were in. When you finally found the grave, you'd be out of breath and contemplating your own mortality. We learned at a young age to sit on the guard railing that keeps us from falling back down the mountain and fold rice paper with square of gold or silver foil in the center into ingots or ancient Chinese money by rolling a single sheet into a tube and folding in the sides. Once we have folded enough ingots to fill paper bags as big as my five-year-old niece, we would bring it to the nearby fire pit to burn, to send to the spirit world, a devotional same day delivery through the rising smoke and ash. Along with pre-bought and packaged paper iPhones, iPads, headphones, a paper roasted pig, a paper roasted duck with paper chopsticks, paper dim sum, paper ha gao siu mai ta siu bao, a paper suit with a paper tie and a paper hat, paper gold watches, paper gold necklaces, paper gold bracelets, paper razors, paper shavers with extra paper blades, paper Hennessy XO brandy, paper cigarettes and paper lighters, shiny glossy paper shoes, shiny glossy paper BMWs, and wads and wads and wads of paper money, $1 billion bills, all heading in the fire to the afterlife. I imagine him in line at the spirit world commissary, receiving all his provisions for the year. Everyone else up there jealous that his family sent him more. We wash and scrub his tombstone and the tombstones next to him to make sure his neighbors treat him well. Meanwhile, I'm wondering, what use is an iPhone to a man who died in 1994? Wondering if the BMW he receives is the same size as the paper one we burned. Wondering if his new paper wallet can hold all the paper bills we sent. Wondering if we really should be sending him liquor and cigarettes and if we still have to worry about his health. Then we all line up in family and age order to pour tea on his grave as well as a small cup of brandy since it was his favorite. Light three sticks of incense each, bring it up to our faces, bow three times and say a quiet prayer before putting the incense in the pot in the middle of his tombstone. 
My least favorite part is trying to find a good spot to put the incense and avoid the embers of the others falling onto my hand. I imagine him sitting in a telephone booth, hearing every wish we say to him in our heads, but only understanding Cantonese, the language he's spoken his entire life. Mine is a disjointed Chinglish that comes from having gone to a British school as a child. So every year to be respectful and to make sure he understands me, I have to ask my mom, how do I say, please look after this family in Chinese? How do I say, please bless this family with health and prosperity in Chinese? How do I say, I hope you're having a good afterlife in Chinese? Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks, Pamela. <laughs> my brother, my mother, and I were sitting in a booth at a nice Italian restaurant in an upscale mall in Hong Kong. We went there for the pasta and ordered some cocktails to start, a night away from drinking soup with our shared Chinese dishes. When the food came, only my brother and I were embarrassed as we passed large, heavy plates between us sharing our food the same way we do at home, but without the lazy Susan spitting in the center. The Western style food came in tiny portions and failed to fill us. And after sharing the two morsels of pasta entrees between the three of us, we were still hungry. So we ordered a whole fish to share. It comes to us steaming on a wheeled cart, aluminum, modern, sterile, almost as if it should be carrying medical utensils instead. The fish smelled like the ones we ate at home every day, just a little off, as if the herbs that were sprinkled all around it were from the wrong garden, the wrong market, the wrong hands, made for a different tongue. Growing up Chinese in Hong Kong, I pride myself in knowing how to eat a fish, to scour not as a need, but a want, because the body of the fish is not the most delicious part. My favorite part is the tail and the spine. Not many know how much meat is tucked between the spinal bones of the fish. Not many know how to slurp and suck the meat out without, a, without getting a bone stuck in your throat. For my mother, her favorite part of the fish is the head. The older generation usually gets the privilege of eating this part first. We all know that the fish cheek has the softest, smoothest flesh of the fish, but not many know there's more meat in the face inside the gills, behind the eyes. We were given the map of these places as children. Our tongues, the teeth, our, our tongues and teeth, the chisels and mallets used to separate skin from meat, from bone. We do all of this dissection without flipping the fish over. The superstition is that when you flip a fish, you're casting ill fortune on the fishing boats that provided for us. And so there it was lying on a metal dish with a ceramic plate in front of it, the waiter then, in an act that I can only assume is some type of showmanship, proceeds to dissect the fish, like the type of man who cuts his spaghetti, untrustworthy and offensive, maiming it with a knife and fork, removing the skin, removing the head, removing the parts that my tongue was asking for, parts that Western people don't know how to savor. We all shared the same expression, like watching drunk tourists tumble down the hill of Lan Kwai Fong, a disaster unfolding in slow motion. And after he's removed what he thought was the most amount of fish possible, he attempts to wheel off the fish carcass, leaving with the same amount of fish as the amount he had given us. My brother and I looked at my mom and then each other. We knew what was going to happen. My mother interrupted the leaving waiter to ask, actually, can we keep the plate? Immediately after placing it in front of her, she forgets that knives and forks even exist, picking up the fish head with her hands to eat it, slurping loudly, hunched over, spitting out bone after bone after her mouth had scrubbed it of its meat. You didn't even know fish had, piling up on her plate like a mountain, eating it the correct way. I wonder if we taste fish differently because we're eating so much more, like reading a book, but instead of reading the words, we're absorbing the ink, the pages, the paper, the glue, the binding, the spine, 
the colors of the cover, and then everything else in between. Thank you. Thank you, Viv. That I'm still like clinging on to some of the things you said, herbs in the wrong garden, the body of the fish, knowing how to eat a fish. Um, the tongue is being mapped to these places and also thinking of like what it means to be um, from a place that like my relationship to the water has largely affected the way that I've become who I am, right? Being from the Caribbean, right? So what are ways in which this fish could sort of lay as a metaphor for that? Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Saray Janelle Johnson. Saray Janelle Johnson is a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Res Rosenberg Fellow and the inaugural poet in residence at the Brooklyn Public Library. Slingshot, Nightboat Books, 2019. His first book of poetry won a Lombada Literary Award in gay poetry. And I, Saray is someone that I deeply, deeply admire and, and I think is just so beautiful. And I had the privilege of taking a class with Saray uh, with Hilton Owls. And thank you for holding space with us tonight. Thanks for inviting me, Jeffrey. I'm Saray Jarrell Johnson. My middle name is after Superman's father. So um, yeah, Jarrell, I, sometimes I think that that R can look like an end. So I get end up getting called Janelle, which is a different kind of black name, a beautiful black name, but not mine. Um, so this poem is called The Six International and it will be an uh, uh, issue, a forthcoming issue of Atmos Magazine. As the blustering sheets take the shape of bled dark, shadowy forgers shake sleep encased in lead dark. When the nectar runs thick, foragers lick down the neck. From the tongue, a new heat curves silhouetted dark. Now the lover won't weep when he leaves to scarf spark streets. She sleeps as he wished he could sleep in naked dark. Whose work is lauded? Whose labor bids no remark, but gliders and sparkers, sleepless, piloted dark. Each night squinting out the window, sallow torrent of bright. Moth covens dance, entranced in winnowed dark. Once proboscis pride opened the tuberose cave and passionate, suckled before blushing blood dark. Without warning like sky flame, the door hinge ablade, the love enters wordless, makes the lover dread dark. Wind of owls hunting squeeze stamen to piston, talons rhyme, prey threatened, struck wild, then the red dark. What do moths do, spent from their night light rendezvous? Near dry beds, they lie bed, con eds limited dark. Um, and this next poem is, is from my book, Slingshot, um, and it's called Magenta. And it has a running title, so I'll say that two times. Magenta, the kind my homie Leah calls screaming vulva, a sparkler through gray hair with glint of mercury. Quickly we become elders in this city, smears our fingers like new murder. They're my mentor with Sinti Roma's bleeding tarot. When I was a kid, they wrote Femme Shark Manifesto. I lived a life with pink books and gem mischief. That zine is the zine that I mean when I mean the zine. It was a roll call for Femme Styles, pumped a sailing shot of sadness, but at least there was fucking to look forward to. I wanted to grow up, then be them, then be their friend forever, wash all their dishes, eat drying pizza out the box. So I filled three bags and moved to Oakland. It was blank verse for 10 months and fucking. I slept on Anna's couch as ever and wrote for weed magazines. Hot handed roof gardens blush pink as lips. The other ocean coughed out boys with limps and lisps. Prince punctuated all my trysts. I did an op for about six months, a future flush with losers gear. He won't tell you about the rapes, but he paints and sculpts them in his face where eyebrows once were and should appear. Alas, this poem can't reinstall the skin nor grow his eyebrows back again. His fetid hide has ceased to be for all of our eternities and for this only impotence. A poem mauve with fizzy goiter, flaccid as Pacific six race dude. A poem to coil you in fistula of yarn and stars. Thank you.
Thank you, Saray. And my apologies for reading that as Janelle, Terrell. And I too look forward to Magenta. Wow, thank you so much. Next up, we have our lovely Sonia Thama. Sonia, you in the house? All right. Sonia Farmer is a Bahamian writer, book artist, publisher, and founder of Pontiana Paper Press, where she works with writers and artists to advance cultural ownership and voice Caribbean artists. And um, I, I think I really want to point out the fact that tonight and now we have two very special Bahamian poets, Sonia, who's one whose practice I deeply admire, and I'm just so happy to see you in the Bahamas doing your thing, both as a poet and also as a visual artist. So really looking forward to what you share tonight. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, thank you for having me. I uh, apologies, my internet was being a little bit struggly, so I hope that everything comes through okay in the next 10 minutes. Um, I also have a cat on my lap now, so that's the Zoom life. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm gonna read some um, pieces from my current project where I'm making um, obliterated erasures. It took me a long time to respond to Hurricane Dorian um, through my work, uh, but then the Bahamian artist, Leanne Russell, who is from the Abacos where Hurricane Dorian flattened, um, shared an article with me, a 1933 article in Harper's Magazine by a man named Terence Keo. Uh, he's an American tourist who experienced the, um, the Great Abaco Hurricane, which is what it was called in 1932, which um, destroyed the Abacos in a similar way that Hurricane Dorian did in 2019. So I've been using that text to mine new narratives um, about what it is like to live in um, a very vulnerable place during a time of climate crisis and injustice. So these are the poems, um, a couple of poems from that collection. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, and some accompanying images kindly shared by Jeffrey at the last moment, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so we'll start um, with the next slide for this poem. Here we go. Up to the collar. I have spent my entire life at sea, constantly watching barometers, gathered in the violent gale of hurricanes that happened to be within reach. I realized just how hard it was to abandon it in this part of the world, what was going to happen. The idea of going back nailed closed. My watch had by now stopped full of water and my heart, under all kinds of weather conditions, is flooded with rain, beating in squalls with all of its fury. Missing. The day was breaking, blown to pieces by the wind and by waves that called a solid wall of water through the air. Stripped of my clothes, I turned in and lifted bodily off, straining and creaking in this movable shelter. Walls, thick with a steady undercurrent of the sound among the mangroves on the shore. Belonging forever, as sailors say, to the tidal hours. Smashed to pieces. Anything I say is inadequate. Lord knows how hard it was, trapped in such frightful destruction. The water got so deep that we left on a plank, carrying nothing and from nowhere, bound by something trying all the time to remain. Crawling upon hands and knees, every joint creaked but only the wildest prayer could be heard howling the place down, like a shower of leaves hurtling through the air, being sent off to leeward death. 
crashed. The building was collapsing in my arms. All this time, I had regard for the laws of gravitation. Picked up off my feet, all hands were sent sprawling and sang out to grip the mystery that keeps an airplane flying on a puff of wind. Knocked to earth, devotion poured down on my back. And that wreckage became some kind of final shelter on top of us. A point impossible to describe. It was a fearful moment. The first thing I noticed to leave were my legs, heavy as stone. The cold struck out my waist, my hands. Before my face left, I looked back out into the chaos. A house had once stood there. And when I looked, a door suddenly appeared, a flight of steps inside leading to nowhere. And people who had once all crawled like ants were rising up into the arms of a perfect deluge to rest. Spread over the wind. I took the sandy shore of the town, climbed a high hill and studied the sky carefully. Where the sun had gone down, a black mass came to anchor at the port. Out of this, the shades of night became a huge cathedral for me to sleep, my body with the bodies of its inhabitants. Nothing left but the booming of the island's heart on the outer reef, reaching across the water to settle over everything, living and dead, the only reminders of this last September. This final poem is called Approaching. We had ideal weather all the time at a place called home, where we again lived in danger of another 24 hours. We were moving away and toward the prospect of a normal storm. We thought there was a destination, unable to see the condition of this passage fast as it was. The past remained just as it had been, nailed fast to the special moorings of the future. The storm and its people still moving in the direction of intensity. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> I, I, I have to say that I, I really felt something special about you sharing your thoughts around Doreen and the hurricane, because for me, that was a very distant thing, right? Being in, in, in New York when that was happening and finally going down to Abaco this year, January, and it felt like that just happened two weeks ago. So your words really resonated. Um, with me. And then I want to share one more thing. Some of you may have gotten uh, holiday cards from me and I didn't design those. The beautiful Sonia Palmer did. And y'all should support her business. Pointy on a picky press. I'd appreciate if you drop, drop the link in the chat just so we can get more of your goodness. Absolutely, I will. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Next up, we have the one and only Pamela Sneed in the house. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pamela Sneed is a New York based poet, performer, visual artist, and educator. Sneed is the author of several books, including Funeral Diva, City Lights Book 2020, and Sweet Dreams, Belladonna 2018, and has performed at the Whitney Museum, Brooklyn Museum, the Highline, and the New Museum. And I was lucky enough to have Pamela Sneed as one of my professors during my time at Columbia University. So with that, Pamela. 
Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm honored to be here. And for me, it's like watching all my, my students grow up. <laughs> so I'm really proud of all of you. I know, <laughs> you know, Viv, that was like really beautiful and everybody's poetry was really beautiful. And I have a book out again, Funeral Diva. It's, it was written up in the Times, publishes weekly. I'm getting good reviews, what? And uh, so anyway, um, and when I met Viv, I said I wasn't a visual artist. And I guess that was just, the <laughs> that was the beginning <laughs> of becoming one. Okay. Uh, eight minutes, 46 seconds. That they would sit on a man's neck till his body, breath, spirit gave out. That they rendered him inaudible, voiceless. That eight minutes passed, eight minutes, 46 seconds. It took days in citizens' uprisings for the police officers involved to be arrested. That the news showed that one officer casually sitting on the black man's neck, as if the man below were a deer, mountain grizzly, a bounty trophy subdued, until there was no wrestling, no life left. That the great AIDS activist, Larry Kramer, would die days later that we all owe him something of our lives, that his memorial went on, that the chat closed before I could say again, thank you, Larry Kramer. Keep fighting. Before I could type George Floyd's name in the chat box, say the two were connected in the struggle for human rights. Based on keen observation, and lived almost scientific experience, I've surmised from everyone, regardless of color, that the popular phrase, Black Lives Matter, only applies when it's people you don't know, like Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Amud Arbery, and countless trans and cis women. Black people who are known get familial type treatment, particularly from white friends who continue to talk over you, doubt your lived experiences, ignored, minimized or denied, they constantly insert their perceived innate superiority, constantly competing, perhaps it's unconscious because everyone's internalized, particularly other blacks, that we can't earn and deserve nice things. Reminds me of the complaints I've heard from every major movement, those who gave their lives to save others, but neglected partners, spouses, children. Makes me think of when I visited the apartheid museum in South Africa, and I read that the whole of the movement was fought so that Black kids could look in the mirror and feel good about who they were. Reminds me of how easily personal details get lost in pursuit of bigger pictures. That said, using Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and Earthseed as an example, a template where God is protein, ever-changing action, I, promote, I propose Black Lives Matter no longer be used as a statement, but becomes practice pedagogy, a methodology, means of examination, a 10 point plan, where our eyes and our lenses are trained to scrutinize and ensure black lives really do matter. It's like living in an old house where now the floorboards, piping, very ground must be, must be replaced, which is not to say black lives matter can not also function as an important statement. I can't tell you what it's like to visit some suburbs, known Trump land, where red, white, and blue American flags decorate every lawn, but in one single solitary window, there's a sign written on brown cardboard in black letters that says, Black Lives Matter. It's like that candle in the window of an abolitionist signaling, signaling to a runaway, there's some safety to be found here. They're finding out now that COVID-19 ravages not just lungs, but also kidneys, the heart. I'm thinking of all those families now can and could not see their loved ones buried, could not say goodbye, or all the lives that could have been saved with proper masks, gloves, respirators, preparation, and preparedness by our own government. If they hadn't fired the pandemics team two years ago, they keep saying COVID-19 is like the AIDS era. I beg to differ. It's nothing like that for me. 
Each was, is its own beast. Corona for me feels closest to ground zero, the shock, staggering losses of life. After 9-11, they were keeping corpses and body parts on ice in a Chelsea skating rink in case families had to identify parts. With the AIDS era, not only the hundreds and thousands of deaths, but they're forgetting the role stigma played, the queer factor, when a whole segment of the population was left to die and no one even acknowledged the crisis, a government and world that declared it was God's punishment against homosexuals, families that disowned, throughout their children's remains, an illness that tore families' communities apart, separated lovers. I wasn't even 30 yet, having lost most of my friends. Yes, there are things to learn from organizing, the fight against, but please don't make shaky, shaky comparisons to something you've never lived through or understand how the world hates homosexuals and queers for people of color, it's worse. And this is the last piece I'm going to read. And um, <laughs> okay. yeah. inadvertently during a conference, during a conference meeting a black student, a black student and I start to giggle over a Black Lives Ma uh, Matter banner she sees outside of her window each day. It's hung on the side of a building. We understand the irony that a major corporate gentrifier responsible for the displacement of hundreds of thousands of Blacks that destroyed all sense of Black culture in its midst, that even closed the damn fast food restaurant, the only common place for different races and classes to mix, now has hung a banner on one of its buildings after the murder of George Floyd stating Black Lives Matter. We giggle. <laughs> I tell her she should keep a journal each day she encounters it, how she feels each moment, and she is angry which leads us to discussing all the useless paper and ink and pens utilized by all those organizations who issued Black Lives Matter statements, but failed to do the most basic things like putting black people in leadership roles or listening to what their black staff and friends had said for years. Statements issued as if we weren't there, weren't important, valuable, leading me to today where a white police officer pepper sprayed the eyes of a nine-year-old black girl. He shouted, stop acting like a child. She screamed back, I am a child, which is a dynamic I've been pointing out for years, the maltreatment of black women and girls by almost everyone, by POC, straight, white, LGBTQI plus, doesn't matter. Reminds me of a situation where I've wound up like a volleyball caught between two white guys. One is jealous of me, the other uses us against each other to get what he wants. Both claim queer black allyship, though neither seems to understand how their behavior for me is like pepper spray, shot into the eyes, a stun gun, the metal of a police baton, a knee burrowed into the windpipe, completely crushing it, a last breath gurgled out into complete stillness as the world watches. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like talk about a mic drop just now. You thank you so much for everything, man. Black Lives Matter is practice and pedagogy. That part. Right yeah. yeah. All right. So next up, uh, we're gonna have Merrick Goma read for us, and. I've been very lucky to spend the last year of my life with this dazzling young gentleman. Now I'll say some kind of words about where you're from. Maragoma. <clears throat> Maragoma, who claims to be from New York, was actually born in Manistee, Michigan. Maragoma is an artist who works with light to create dramatic and thought-provoking images. Merrick focuses on culture, and psychology and his work to draw the viewer into asking questions about themselves and the world around them. Merrick was a Next Haven inaugural studio fellow in 2019. And I've once again been very, very lucky to spend, this was my quabu right here. We spent <laughs> a lot of time together and I'm just so grateful to know you and thank you for everything you've done. And with that, please share your words with us. Thank you for that introduction, Jeffrey. Um, man, that's, it's, it's uh, hard to follow up with Hamlet Snead. <laughs> um, but 
I will do my best. Um, I've been working on a series, uh, kind of thinking about absence and um, not necessarily absence of loss, but all different forms of absence. And I thought it was kind of poignant thinking about uh, these poems because uh, Jeffrey's uh, sculptures were kind of losing themselves after a while and kind of becoming their own form of absence, you know, the absence of the body and source. So without further ado, um, this one's called uh, Absence and Desire. I have lingered here for too long. My hands ache with a sense of empty. Taking in the stillness of the moment and longing to move you. But I don't. I feel the weight of you, the heat of you, in its turbulence. Flayed, I weep, and the weight turns into a mountain. And each strike, a private tear erodes it. Uh, so the next one is, uh, Your Absence is My Monument. That's kind of the name of my series I'm working on right now for my uh, visual series. Of, I sat right behind me at this moment that I'm currently working on. Uh, but this is kind of like the idea of what's been kind of going through my head. I am always at a loss of words. I want to find the strongest of feelings in these phrases or to carve them into stone and have these sentences and feelings last forever to have something that stands the test of time. <laughs> Our memories are fallible and I cannot trust myself to keep every detail. As time shifts, I feel I'm losing parts of you. The details washing away slowly, smoothing edges like water over stone. Or perhaps I find myself forgetting parts of you as if moss is covered over formations because I haven't tended to my memories of you for far too long. Everything changes, even my monument to you. Nothing is free from time desire to change things. Even the parts we keep inside and try to protect from the elements, something slips in and slips something out but you are still there. Or maybe your absence is still there, an empty vessel that will empty its contents once there is no one to remember you or me, and the absence remembers who it is once more. Sure and sweet. <laughs> That's all I got for today. But yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Merrick. I, I think there's also, there's something I want to share just about the relationship of what you're doing with words, the relationship between that and your practice and how I feel like in some ways that's that's a key to understanding your work. Um, yeah. right. You want to explain it or do you want me to explain it? I want you to explain it. Uh. Um, so I kind of write various stories for each one of my, for my, uh, photographs, uh, and, uh, sets. So each one of them oftentimes takes on like four different stories that I write and I try to culminate all those different stories to try to like finally make this image and this environment and space that has so many different ways and avenues in which to enter, but still centered on the idea that I'm trying to construct, which is about absence. And so that's something that I, I, I take a lot of time in writing for this. And this is just another part of uh, my uh, practice. Thank you, Merrick. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> Our next reader is going to be Anne Lai. Anne is an artist who works with photography and language. Her latest publication is Evergreen, The Song Cave, 2019. She also runs Care of Time, a publishing project focused on artist writings. And with no further ado, Anne, take us away. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, 
I'll read a little bit from Evergreen, um, but I'll do a little preface. <laughs> Art takes from life, so naturally life is reflected back at us. Photography takes after our likeness. Poetry takes after our language and sculpture takes after our dimension. I've been looking for, for the fourth dimension and I think it is fond of pressing up against the playing glass, getting up close to life to process its movements, its variations, finding pleasure and pain from seeing life in all forms of us living and being. If the mind is a muscle, thinking is its practice, and healing is the lifelong maintenance of living. To descend a staircase, upend defeat, automating nerves to numb to reach, shooing fluorescence from then to return, landing on all fours. I felt this before. Oh, where was it? It's going to gone, I knew it. This poor memory of mine getting poorer. Do you ever think about not just for cats, but for all of us beings too? Them lives following the same general route, but chance and circumstance bearing each go around? Look here, have I felt this before? Or is a part of me and a part of you with you reflecting back and that's what's going on. We're made of the same stuff, you know. I'm sensitive and you're sensitive. So who discovered whom? But I think you're going to outlast me. I mean, I know, at least in this particular life. And I can't shake this feeling, but I recognize you from somewhere before in this life. Am I making sense? You got me thinking again, and well, that's another dimension. Awaiting watchers look out, replicating to matter of mind on mass with hold and give. For as a threshold, long embodying, clear envisioning selfdom, based off chance happening within array of living proofs waving en route, like them, you, right now, there. Today, them eyes go easy now, looking to the other side, full on, hoping for evergreen to appear, a new young world of dimensions, ecosystems, noticing rabbit holes, a moving, breathing vision could be sighted on a clear day, deposits the peripheral question of how to hold on to a sense of sense through time and its affects on, well, being, including maintenance of a body and flexing of its mind. Word for word is not even exactly word for word as entropy does atrophy over time and delivery, as thought gets going, making room for chance appears only when end becomes beginning, infinity plus one, etc. This is what was noticed that seemed closest to well-being, including witness deviceless like them, you right now, there. These life structures holding hands with like structures. They say a way of living through conditions in relation to matter, matter. These, this picture, that's a body busy processing the outside in. Self copying, a reading, a writing, a revising within her mind, fully pulling the plate youthful of promise, recalling one's own early era, skipping the small talk, making up her mind her words as she goes. 
If revelations are not to exactitude, but a running through, no, uh, going up and down, imaginary staircases, best see to it as a kindness of stretch into self-inquiry, such as, is this muscle or bone, a knot, a tender tendon, the nerve of nerves. Awaiting her living being, taken after you, rib beamings, lean to structures, slept in autumn leaves, her fingers feeling walls for a light switch. Grown out of practice came accidental loss, stressing from examples, endurance for what? An operating nonsense to become a tired looking glass in transit, a refracting vision in 21st century, a slow blinding account, copying notes from systems who seem to know better on some evenings before the slip to sleep, thought goes out walking. There's still life to see. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your words with us, Anne. Uh, there's this one quote that you have in there, healing is the long maintenance of living. Did I, did I say that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I really love that. I feel like that it really resonates with a lot of the things that I'm thinking about in the studio. Yeah, and I wrote that thinking about your work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> actually, I, I, I don't know. I actually, the word maintenance is being like with me a lot um, because I've been making these sculptures that keep breaking down and need uh, new motors. Like I've spent a lot of money on maintaining things and what does that mean? And I yeah. still figuring out what my relationship to that is. Thank you, and You're welcome. <laughs> our next reader is going to be Maylene Seymour Major. And a quick bio on Maylene. Maylene Seymour Major's poetry is heavily influenced by nature, but also, but she also writes about Caribbean and all black experiences of love. Seymour Major has an MA in poetic practice from Royal Holloway University of London and has taught creative writing at the University of the Bahamas as an adjunct professor. And I have to add that I'm so grateful um, for you for being here with us, with child at this very moment. Uh, so with no further ado, thank you, Maylene. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to get started. The first poem is called fruit sampling. Man can be anything, firm, tall pineapple with crown, rough green sugar apple that bursts in your hand, brown flesh sapodilla, so syrupy you taste it on your lips, days after eating. Man can have anything, tart pink guava, musky fat soursop, slices of perfect orangey red papaw, that spill round black seeds at every cut. Mango, sweet golden mango, with hair that stays in your teeth days after eating. Woman must choose one thing, juju or starfruit, never both. She cannot gorge herself at the market, suck the peach flesh of Ganep, then eat three sugar banana until she's satiated. She cannot celebrate her appetite. She must have a favorite or be labeled spoiled, rotten, develop black spots, attract fruit flies. Woman must always look ripe, juicy, ready, never for herself. Okay, the second poem <laughs> is going to be, um, it's called Bougainvillea. It's from the same series, so. Woman is not enough. Must bleed out babies created in love, weep into pillows and rise for work the next day with a smile. Woman must walk around with trauma, locked in her brain, careful at least, careful lest it leak out, offend or upset some man's life. Woman must be fearful of having space and time for herself. 
Night is a weapon held against her. She cannot enjoy the stars, the silence. Woman must be Bougainvillea, without thorns, anything but her human self. Okay, the third poem is called By the Sea. <clears throat> if you live by the sea, you cannot be afraid of sea creatures. You must master them. Pull from the water hole grouper, conchs slick with slime, spiny crawfish, slit them from top to tail, pull their insides out, remove their eyes, wash them in salt, wrestle them from barbarous shells, eat their flesh with lots of lime and pepper. If you live by the sea, you cannot be afraid of the water, must master the waves, currents and tides, develop gills behind your ears, grow iridescent scales along your legs, between your thighs, they turn into a tail, propel you to plumb the depths, with spare on watch for salty beasts, in search of secrets, bullion and bones. If you live by the sea, you cannot be afraid of ghosts, must master their moods, learn to swim in souls. These drowned Africans have made the sea a garden for your belly, fatten fish, mollusk and crustacean for your children, lay buried in chains in sand instead of graves for royalty where we can kneel. There is nowhere to kneel, we must swim. Uh, poem four. Wow. <laughs> oh, I just want to say wow um, before you get to like the end and you can continue now. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, this one is called Where It's Warm. Um, and it's a poem in sort of seven short little snippets. So where it's warm. A cold front is coming. I am alone. It ain't always sunny here. Days of rain turn the shores to salty sludge. The sky, a cloudy mirror, reflecting the despair of the people. The tourists still come though. I think hurricanes come from the West African coast to claim us displaced natives. We wait in silence, in candlelight, fearful. Singing white Christmas should be a sin. Our open fires are for goat skin drums. To make a dollar, I sit in a freezing office that could be anywhere while my birthright sells. I am Esau. I enjoy days on the beach. Salt drying on my skin like jewels. Sun baking me brown like pigeon peas. Sand fine and soft like sugar. Sea clear and cool. Until I remember, slaves drowned in this same water. They had pigeon pea colored skin too. So I float, my eyes closed to the sun, my body the sign of the cross. I am an offering. The sun touching my skin is only a blessing when I am free. And the last poem um, is called, This is not a sonnet about my hair being combed. Consider the art of the comb, the symmetry and easy math, oil slicked fingernails on dusty roads, sharp swords piercing flesh and field, a market for care and love touch. Between the knees of a mother or lover, view supplicant and God. Blooms of bright bougainvillea, soft woven baskets of blessings, flame-topped poinciana, sit on pain and suffering and beauty. Legs falling asleep, a crown emerges, blue magic. And that's all I got for you. 
You give us all that and then some. Wow, thank you, Melian. I you. I feel I feel like you just took me back home between the pigeon peas and the sun and the sky and the sexism and the sort of fucked upness of being in the Bahamas is really beautiful place. Um, yeah, thank you. That really transported me. Awesome. Great. And our next poet reader is going to be Michelle Fongting, who I'm equally as excited to hear share some words of wisdom with us tonight. Um, Michelle Fongting is a poet born to Vietnamese refugees and based in New Haven, Connecticut, a recipient of the 2020 Poetry and Industry Prize and Fellowship from Brooklyn Poets, Fine Arts Work Center, Kenyan Writers Workshop, and Next Haven. Ting currently studies poetry and community with makers in New Haven and at NYU. And I just have to say how much um, since moving to New Haven and being a part of the Next Haven Court along with Michelle uh, that her craft has really in fact affected the way that I think about mine in this very symbiotic way. And I think also being around you has really affected my relationship to poetry. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jeffrey. And it's really an honor and like just a pleasure to be in this poetry virtual room right now. There's like so many things that are just resonating. So really thank the other poets for sharing their work too. <clears throat> I'm gonna start with a poem. Um, it's called Exile's Portion. Outside the window, looking in, fine and warm someone's, astonished to find myself among them. In the dream, I wade back with an obelisk, dove gray. The crest of a wave makes a thunderous awning, portending awake. I observe as a mouse, making do between doorframe and floor tile to catch a glimpse of housewife or kitten, I do a little ditty. Deep down, I find not a husk. Fronds of phragmites rather wave me off, pleased to see I've stopped heaving stones, born like another's young, righteous woman I was. Above an enormous hawk, Careens past two streets. Is it that easy to breathe the heave out, to sigh and seize the mind's wires singed from having sent electricity to homes other than my own? I could weep. I could crawl back in, wondering about light. If they could bear mine. If the labor to gather stones and splay them by the road would suffice. Their size and crystalline features, each crevice and dimple to note for the speculator only I know. Eventually, I collect myself, appraised and scorned. Nothing is for sale. This next poem um, is in progress. And one of the joys of being in community with um, Jeffrey, as well as Daniel and Merrick um, has been just like being able to see their work in progress. And that's part of the generosity of like inviting each other into these like creative spaces where things are unfinished. Um, I think one of the things I remember chatting a lot with Jeffrey and I, I, I see this so much in his work is um, just the ambivalence of um, being considered part of a nation or like partially part of a nation. And um, I've been thinking a lot about like, what are these associations or affiliations um, that are sort of like thought as given, but thought of as given or sort of taken for granted and um, like 
truly like the fickleness of those things, whether it's like nation or likeness. And I think in writing this, there are a few historical references that I figured it would be useful to note. Um, one of them, I mentioned the High Batchung sisters. And these are uh, sisters who um, were famously known to uh, essentially overthrow the, um, to overthrow colonial Chinese rule um, in Vietnam. Uh, but ultimately they were um, executed or you know, committed suicide. It's not really known. Um, and the second is um, I mentioned uh, burning in Pacific Grove, California. And that's uh, the site of uh, a village of um, early Chinese fishermen in that community who were essentially burned out. Luckily, no one died in that situation. Um, there's also two quotes. Uh, the first is, um, uh, the fire left a scorch mark up the back of my shirt. This is um, a quote from the 89-year-old grandmother who was burned in Brooklyn uh, earlier this summer. Um, the second is, you could feel the sun but not see it. And this is from testimonies of men who were in re-education camps at, um, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Um, so I'll just read this and grateful for the space to share something unfinished. Underside. On the one hand, it'd be a luxury to hide behind closed eyelids, to drop off the map while making history. Somewhere down in the dirt, the High Bachung sisters made it home and the river won't forget it. Behind the assembly lines, doing my duty to assemble us Asian Americans into a dozen neat microscopic rows, I set down momentarily tweezer and latex glove to sit and sink beneath a mouth, a furrowed brow and relax into a derision of dynasty to remember my place on the underside here before, repeatedly wooed by the richer and benefited brethren who lured the peasantry out from their huts to learn promising tongues of the occupying nation. I like to envision myself in that place when I get too known, squatting by a pot, steam risen, face indifferent in the dissipation. I sink into this preferred position as I watch the masquerade of cultural preservation nations dole out in hot pot and dumpling and red envelope money, remembering the inward feeling I must maintain within the richer sister's ranch style home I dine in, looking up from the bowl of congee auntie made me, marveling at all this pillar in the middle of the living room, this marble and iMac and underbread jars full of cabbage patch kids, marveling at how they wanted, how they made it. Remembering cross jellies in Monterey blend in, remembering to stick together, to follow the leader, to opt for secondhand Ross Tag discount emulations. Remembering Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remembering King Nebuchadnezzar's guards went up in flames too. Remembering cheers rose with the smoke as Pacific Grove burned. Remembering the uniforms also disintegrate. Remembering two towels, blank face. Remembering the scorned Vietnamese recited 20 page false confessions to skirt the grave. Remembering stacks of letters on camp guards desks sent out of order to displace grandfather from time and space. Remembering those who achieved distinction received bronze stars or signed certificates, sometimes a beheading, reciting this folk tale song and Stella by heart should the occupying nation raise the graves, burning our characters, every last one, remembering the fire left a scorch mark up the back of my shirt, remembering to shut the door behind me to keep out the war before going to sleep over, remembering the horror and sister's blank face, am I the misbehaving Asian to sink to the bottom of an airless metal cell so hot you could feel the sun but not see it. Some men burned. Some men could not remember their names. Remember boy, who, get, thou, gong, huang, dang, swan, huan, to remain a bit salty writing these letters in promising tongues 
to gaze out this bottom unperturbed, to sit somewhat indifferent to the opportunity doled out by whatever race rich benevolence is these days, to gently refuse the ho-hum happy to have their boba if I don't prefer it, if I don't perform errant note, errant note in a symphony, treason of the well-to-do and pitied mute. Not any favor to me to be put on a platform to fill the question mark. Not made a masquerade, not your mother, your sister, your auntie, not without sitting sardined, camped out in the lowest pit on an airless day in the river's grave, marveling at the way waves bleed black hair back and forth like minnows riveting horizon on a hot day. You know what I mean? Not in between false recognition and double blind eyelid eyewitness, not sure you can relate, not akin akimbo, teetering on necessary affiliate because the boat leaves now and I grab the closest to me, push off the marsh, forget my lines in the harrow of animosity, in the history of the martyred, forget what nation I report to momentarily, all this to sing a note, to shatter the thrones, to sing the one true thing, whether the ones I sing for are alive or well-fed or well-read enough to hear it. <laughs> wow, uh, wow. Wow. Wow, Michelle. Wow. Wow. I, damn, I, I am, um, there's a, a moment in, uh, on Earth where Briefly Gorgeous, Michelle, where Fung is talking about um, um, how the beautiful thing about singing national anthems is the fact that we're all on our feet. So when we're ready to run, we can just scram. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for that, Michelle. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have the man, the legend himself. <laughs> I see Dan. Oh. <laughs> who I've also had the pleasure of, sh of sharing time with at Next Haven. Um, I'll just read your bio and then you can close us out for the night. Pleasure. Daniel T. Gator Lomac is a completely self-taught artist living and working in Los Angeles, LA. Gator Lomac's practice can be defined as walking a fine line comprised of DNA, time-honored existence, and poetic totality. Damn. Unveiling a window of art making for the viewer to look through. Bearing all, Daniel picks up where the battle leaves off, ritualizing narratives and embodying cultural legacies that he's influenced by or subconsciously led to produce. Materials are sourced from mundane environments, communities, landscapes, the unknown, and bringing a variety of media. <clears throat> Daniel was a grant recipient of the Remo Hartman Foundation LA grant in 2018. Um, he has exhibited art fairs and at artists run international alternative commercial and museum galleries such as BBQLA, Mike Gallery, LTD Los Angeles, LAX Art, Transmission UK, Torrance Art Museum, and Nada Miami. Um, so with no further ado, Daniel. Thank you, Jeffrey, very much. Um, everyone did a great job and I'm very inspired um, and it's so beautiful to see everyone's faces. Uh, congratulations on your exhibition, Jeffrey. It was a smash and I'm um, very proud of you and, and happy to be here with all of you. Um, so um, this first poem is titled Magic Man. Go for the juggler, he will tell you. Go for the juggler, she will tell you. Choke me like a dog until my face is yell blue. Many get the nod, but yes, become the few. A cause so damn rings tones of the dampest views. These streets bear hustlers, the wise and fools. Milking the dead cow while the kitten cries for food. Smiles and booze, graduation caps and jewels. Crimes and crews, I'm cool, but who am I to you? Corner to corner hand in hand. In front of the bodega was his master plan. Magic man, yeah, yeah, magic man. Can you dance like Mr. Bojangles? Sure I can, though I tiptoe so you can't trace my angles. When the body disappears, 
or there is left the ankles. There I am, fresh blood leaking into your chambers, then drown in sand. These horns can get a little dangerous. Don't save him, I repeat, don't save him. Magic man, can you dance like Mr. Bojangles? Magic man. And um, I have, I mean, I made that, I made that poem being here in, in New Haven um, over the course of this last year and a half. Um, I have one more, a couple more actually. Uh, all right. This is called King's Blue, I'll Be Seeing You. I close my eyes and see the colors, the colors that see themselves in me. It was summertime when that yellow house died, when the melting side of the Arctic cried, King's Blue, King's Blue. That's when I knew I was here to stay. Have another one. Right shoulder sore from the baggage I carry. What if it's cancer? In perfect stride, my steps are calculated. I only watch the dancers. And um, this is my last one. It's called Late to a Sunset. Late to a sunset. I'll come back every day chasing the sunset, chasing who I think she could be. Never in my life has a face in transit walk in and out of my mind so much. It has to be something special about us. Thank you. Wow. Talk about a wave of word late to a sunset. Wow. Yeah. So I think we we did it, people. We really um, I've been using this this phrase of holding space together, and I think that's that's really what what I felt tonight with the words that y'all are using and your voices, and just thinking about the power of poetry, right? And this collective language and this collective space that we're building. Um, and I just want to close on this note of, of futurity um because that's that's something that i've been thinking about and i feel as though a lot of what what you guys read tonight has to do with a, a sense of futurity and not just thinking about uh right this this idea of like speculation right because i think that's exactly what we're doing right here through language and through craft and through through words and through um through visual culture uh so i just want to thank you all again for reading and sharing your thoughts. And I know how vulnerable this was for, you know, this is like really intimate, serious stuff that we're doing here and to share this with the world and to be a part of this community with you all. I'm really honored and super grateful. Thank you. And thank you also to White Columns, the staff there that have worked tremendously hard to make this exhibition a success and for giving me this opportunity to share my truth with the world. And finally, thank you to everyone that attended and took time out of your busy Friday evenings because you couldn't be doing anything else and you love me so much. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.